Hello everybody, my name is Remo and in this video we are going to read and study the original Bitcoin white paper. Because if you're interested in cryptocurrencies, this is where it all started, so it's valuable to go back and look at the original text. So let's get started. Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system published by Satoshi Nakamoto on Bitcoin.org and also on the Cypherpunks mailing list in October 2008. Abstract, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. The longest chain not only serves as a proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as a majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best effort basis and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof-of-work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. Number one, introduction. Commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. While the system works well enough for most transactions, it still suffers from the inherent weaknesses of the trust-based model. Completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible since financial institutions cannot avoid mediating disputes. The cost of mediation increases transaction costs, limiting the minimum practical transaction size and cutting off the possibility for small casual transactions. And there is a broader cost in the loss of ability to make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services. With the possibility of reversal, the need for trust spreads. Merchants must be wary of their customers, hassling them for more information than they would otherwise need. A certain percentage of fraud is accepted as unavoidable. These costs and payment uncertainties can be avoided in person by using physical currency, but no mechanism exists to make payments over a communications channel without a trusted party. What is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need for a trusted third party. Transactions that are computationally impractical to reverse would protect sellers from fraud and routine escrow mechanisms could easily be implemented to protect buyers. In this paper, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. The system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. Second, transactions. We define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers the coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adding these to the end of the coin. A payee can verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. And in the graphic, we see three transactions. We see transaction number one, with the public key of owner number one. We have a hash and we have the owner zero's signature in the transaction. And then in the next transaction, we have the public key of owner two. We have the hash of the first transaction included in the second transaction. 
and we have the signature of owner one. And the same in the third transaction, we have the public key of owner three, we have the hash from the previous transaction, and we have the uh, signature of owner number two. That means that the chain of ownership can be mathematically verified because the hash of the previous transaction is always included in the next transaction. And in order to make a transaction, the owner needs to use their private key to sign the transaction. Let's continue. The problem, of course, is the payee can't verify that one of the owners did not double spend the coin. A common solution is to introduce a trusted central authority or mint that checks every transaction for double spending. After each transaction, the coin must be returned to the mint to issue a new coin and only coins issued directly from the mint are trusted not to be double spent. The problem with this solution is that the fate of the entire money system depends on the company running the mint with every transaction having to go through them just like a bank. We need a way for the payee to know that the previous owners did not sign any earlier transactions. For our purposes, the earliest transaction is the one that counts, so we don't care about later attempts to double spend. The only way to confirm the absence of a transaction is to be aware of all transactions. In the Mint-based model, the Mint was aware of all transactions and decided which arrived first. To accomplish this without a trusted party, transactions must be publicly announced. And we need a system for participants to agree on a single history of the order in which they were received. The payee needs proof that at the time of each transaction, the majority of nodes agreed it was the first received. Third, timestamp server. The solution we propose begins with a timestamp server. A timestamp server works by taking a hash of a block of items to be timestamped and widely publishing the hash, such as in a newspaper or a Usenet post. The timestamp proves that the data must have existed at the time, obviously, in order to get into the hash. Each timestamp includes the previous timestamp in its hash, forming a chain with each additional timestamp reinforcing the ones before it. So that is actually what we mean by a blockchain. We have a block of items, we create a hash out of it, and in the next block we include the hash of the previous block, which creates a chain of blocks, therefore a blockchain. Let's continue with the paper. Number four, proof of work. To implement a distributed timestamp server on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, we will need to use a proof of work system similar to Adam Back's Hashcash, rather than newspaper or Usenet posts. The proof of work involves scanning for a value that when hashed, such as with SHA-256, the hash begins with a number of zero bits. The average work required is exponential in the number of zero bits required and can be verified by executing a single hash. For our timestamp network, we implement the proof of work by incrementing a nonce in the block until a value is found that gives the block's hash the required zero bits. Once the CPU effort has been expended to make it satisfy the proof of work, the block cannot be changed without redoing the work. As later blocks are chained after it, the work to change the block would include redoing all the blocks after it. So here we have two blocks. We have the hash of the previous block, we have a number of transactions, and then we also have the nonce. And then again we hash this complete block and we put it into the next block with the number of transactions and the new nonce. Let's continue. The proof of work also solves the problem of determining representation in majority decision making. If the majority were based on one IP address, one vote, it could be subverted by anyone able to allocate many IPs. Proof of work is essentially one CPU, one vote. The majority decision is represented by the longest chain, which has the greatest proof of work effort invested in it. If a majority of CPU power is controlled by honest nodes, 
the honest chain will grow the fastest and outpace any competing chains. To modify a past block, an attacker would have to redo the proof of work of the block and all blocks after it and then catch up with and surpass the work of the honest nodes. We will show later that the probability of a slower attacker catching up diminishes exponentially as subsequent blocks are added. To compensate for increasing hardware speed and varying interest in running nodes over time, the proof of work difficulty is determined by a moving average targeting an average number of blocks per hour. If they're generated too fast, the difficulty increases. Okay, so let's go back and really understand how proof of work really works. And how it works is that we need a hash with a certain number of required zeros in front of it. And we achieve that by simply incrementing a nonce in the block until the value is found that gives the blocks hash the required numbers of zeros. And the nonce is simply a number. So the computer just takes a one, calculates the hash, looks whether they have the required number of zeros. If not, then takes the number two, does it again, etc. And the computer needs to redo this as many times until the required zeros have been reached in the hash. And the software targets a certain number of blocks per hour. In case of Bitcoin, these are six blocks per hour, so a block every 10 minutes. And if blocks are found faster, then the difficulty would increase. And as far as I understand it, the difficulty would, would increase by requiring more zeros in front of the hash. But maybe there are some other mechanisms as well. So let's continue. Number five, network. The steps to run the network are as follows. Number one, new transactions are broadcast to all nodes. Number two, each node collects new transactions into a block. Number three, each node works on finding a difficult proof of work for its block. Number four, when a node finds a proof of work, it broadcasts the block to all nodes. Number five, nodes accept the block only if all transactions in it are valid and not already spent. Number six, Nodes express their acceptance of the block by working on creating the next block in the chain using the hash of the accepted block as the previous hash. Nodes always consider the longest chain to be the correct one and will keep working on extending it. If two nodes broadcast different versions of the next block simultaneously, some nodes may receive one or the other first. In that case, they work on the first one they received but save the other branch in case it becomes longer. The tie will be broken when the next proof of work is found and one branch becomes longer. The nodes that were working on the other branch will then switch to the longer one. New transactions broadcast do not necessarily need to reach all nodes. As long as they reach many nodes, they will get into a block before long. Block broadcasts are also tolerant of dropped messages. If a node does not receive a block, it will request it when it receives the next block and realizes it missed one. Number six, incentive. By convention, the first transaction in a block is a special transaction that starts a new coin owned by the creator of the block. This adds an incentive for nodes to support the network and provides a way to initially distribute coins into circulation since there is no central authority to issue them. The steady addition of a constant amount of new coins is analogous to gold miners expending resources to add gold to circulation. In our case, it is CPU time and electricity that is expended. The incentive can also be funded with transaction fees. If the output value of a transaction is less than its input value, the difference is a transaction fee that is added to the incentive value of the block containing the transaction. Once a predetermined number of coins have entered circulation, the incentive can transition entirely to transaction fees and be completely inflation free. The incentive may help encourage nodes to stay honest. If a greedy attacker is able to assemble more CPU power than all the honest nodes, 
he would have to choose between using it to defraud people by stealing back his payments or using it to generate new coins. He ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules, such rules that favor him with more new coins than everyone else combined, than to undermine the system and the validity of his own wealth. Number 7. Reclaiming Disk Space Once the latest transaction in a coin is buried under enough blocks, the spent transactions before it can be discarded to save disk space. To facilitate this without breaking the block's hash, transactions are hashed in a Merkle tree, with only the root included in the block's hash. Old blocks can then be compacted by stubbing off branches of the tree. The interior hashes do not need to be stored. And that's how the pruning looks like. Here we have a tree with all of the transactions, but we could actually prune transactions 0, 1 and 2 and only have transaction 3 left, thus saving disk space. Let's continue. A block header with no transactions would be about 80 bytes. If we suppose blocks are generated every 10 minutes, 80 bytes times 6 times 24 times 365 equals 4.2 megabytes per year. With computer systems typically selling with 2 GB of RAM as of 2008 and Moore's law predicting current growth of 1.2 GB per year, storage should not be a problem even if the block headers must be kept in memory. Number 8. Simplified Payment Verification It is possible to verify payments without running a full network node. A user only needs to keep a copy of the block headers of the longest proof-of-work chain, which he can get by querying network nodes until he's convinced he has the longest chain, and obtain the Merkle branch linking the transaction to the block it's timestamped in. He can't check the transaction for himself, but by linking it to a place in the chain, he can see that a network node has accepted it, and blocks added after it further confirm the network has accepted it. And here is a graphical representation of the longest proof of work chain, where we have the different block headers. Let's continue. As such, the verification is reliable as long as honest nodes control the network, but is more vulnerable if the network is overpowered by an attacker. While network nodes can verify transactions for themselves, the simplified method can be fooled by an attacker's fabricated transactions for as long as the attacker can continue to overpower the network. One strategy to protect against this would be to accept alerts from network nodes when they detect an invalid block, prompting the user's software to download the full block and alert the transactions to confirm the inconsistency. Businesses that receive frequent payments will probably still want to run their own nodes for more independent security and quicker verification. So if you want to be absolutely sure and verify everything yourself, you can do it by running your own node. Let's continue. Number 9. Combining and splitting value. Although it would be possible to handle coins individually, it would be unwieldy to make a separate transaction for every cent in a transfer. To allow value to be split and combined, transactions contain multiple inputs and outputs. Normally, there will be either a single input from a larger previous transaction or multiple inputs combining smaller amounts and at most two outputs, one for the payment and one returning the change, if any, back to the sender. So a transaction consists of one or more or actually many inputs and one or maximally two outputs. It should be noted that fan out where transaction depends on several transactions and those transactions depend on many more is not a problem here. There is never the need to extract a complete standalone copy of a transaction's history. Number 10. Privacy. The traditional banking model achieves a level of privacy by limiting access to information to the parties involved and the trusted third party. The necessity to announce all transactions publicly precludes this method, but privacy can still be maintained by breaking the flow of information in another place. 
by keeping public keys anonymous. The public can see that someone is sending an amount to someone else, but without information linking the transaction to anyone. This is similar to the level of information released by stock exchanges, where the time and size of individual trades, the tape, is made public, but without telling who the parties were. So we have the traditional privacy model, where we have a trusted third party and a counterparty, and the new privacy model, where we have transactions that are directly publicly broadcast. Let's continue. As an additional firewall, a new key pair should be used for each transaction to keep them from being linked to a common owner. Some linking is still unavoidable with multi-input transactions, which necessarily reveal that their inputs were owned by the same owner. The risk is that if the owner of a key is revealed, linking could reveal other transactions that belonged to the same owner. So in the end, this makes it actually very difficult to keep all of this anonymous. Because if at one point in the future, a public key can be identified with yourself, it could actually reveal all of the history of the transactions that you made. So Satoshi suggests here to always use a new key pair for each transaction. But you also need to be careful that if you have multiple inputs in a single transaction, this could actually reveal you as the owner. Let's continue. Number 11, calculations. We consider the scenario of an attacker trying to generate an alternate chain faster than the honest chain. Even if this is accomplished, it does not throw the system open to arbitrary changes, such as creating value out of thin air or taking money that never belonged to the attacker. Notes are not going to accept an invalid transaction as payment, and honest notes will never accept the block containing them. An attacker can only try to change one of his own transactions to take back money he recently spent. The race between the honest chain and an attacker chain can be characterized as a binomial random walk. The success event is the honest chain being extended by one block, increasing its lead by plus one, and the failure event is the attacker's chain being extended by one block, reducing the gap by minus one. The probability of an attacker catching up from a given deficit is analogous to a gambler's ruin problem. Suppose a gambler with unlimited credit starts at a deficit and plays potentially an infinite number of trials to try to reach break even. We can calculate the probability he ever reaches break even or that an attacker ever catches up with the honest chain as follows. P is the probability of honest note finds the next block. Q is the probability the attacker finds the next block. And QZ is the probability the attacker will ever catch up from Z blocks behind. So the probability is one if P is smaller or equals Q. And the probability is this if P is larger than Q. Given our assumption that P is larger than Q, the probability drops exponentially as the number of blocks the attacker has to catch up with increases. With the odds against him, if he doesn't make a lucky lunge forward early on, his chances become vanishingly small as he falls further behind. We now consider how long the recipient of a new transaction needs to wait before being sufficiently certain the sender can't change the transaction. We assume the sender is an attacker who wants to make the recipient believe he paid him for a while, then switch it to pay back to himself after some time has passed. The receiver will be alerted when that happens, but the sender hopes it will be too late. The receiver generates a new key pair and gives the public key to the sender shortly before signing. This prevents the sender from preparing a chain of blocks ahead of time by working on it continuously until he is lucky enough to get far enough ahead, then executing the transaction at that moment. Once the transaction is sent, the dishonest sender starts working in secret on a parallel chain containing an alternate version of his transaction. The recipient waits until the transaction has been added to a block and Z blocks have been linked after it. He doesn't know the exact amount of progress the attacker has made, 
But assuming the honest blocks took the average expected time per block, the attacker's potential progress will be a Poisson distribution with expected value lambda equals z times q over p. To get the probability the attacker could still catch up now, we multiply the Poisson density for each amount of progress he could have made by the probability he could catch up from that point. Which is math that I basically don't understand. Rearranging to avoid summing the infinite tail of the distribution with another complicated equation and then converting it into C code. Running some results, we can see the probability drop off exponentially with Z. So here we have Q is the probability that the attacker finds the next block, which here is 10%. So basically, if the attacker is behind three blocks, the probability goes down to 1%. And with the probability that the attacker finds the next block increased to 30%, it would take 15 blocks for the probability to be 1%. But as you can see, it falls off very quickly. Here it goes from 100% to 20%, 5%, 1%. And here it goes from 100% to 18%, 4%, 1%. And in the second table, we always have five blocks each. So solving for P less than 0.1%, so if we want the probability of 0.1%, with the probability of 10%, we would need to be 5 blocks ahead, with 15% 8 blocks ahead, with 20% 11 blocks ahead, and with 45% probability, we would need to be ahead 340 blocks for the probability to be 0.1%. Number 12, conclusion. We have proposed a system for electronic transactions without relying on trust. We started with the usual framework of coins made from digital signatures, which provides strong control of ownership, but is incomplete without a way to prevent double spending. To solve this, we proposed a peer-to-peer -peer network using proof of work to record a public history of transactions that quickly becomes computationally impractical for an attacker to change if honest nodes control a majority of CPU power. The network is robust in its unstructured simplicity. Nodes work all at once with little coordination. They do not need to be identified since messages are not routed to any particular place and only need to be delivered on a best effort basis. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the proof of work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. They vote with their CPU power, expressing their acceptance of valid blocks by working on extending them and rejecting invalid blocks by refusing to work on them. Any needed rules and incentives can be enforced with this consensus mechanism. And then we have a couple of references, WDI, B Money from 1998. We have a reference, a design of a secure timestamping service with minimal trust requirements from May 1999. We have how to timestamp a digital document from 1991. We have improving the efficiency and reliability of digital timestamping from 1993. We have secure names for bit strings from 1997. We have Adam Back's Hashcash, a denial of service countermeasure from 2002. And we have Merkle's Protocols for Public Key Crypto Systems from April 1980. And we have Feller's An Introduction to Probability Theory and its Applications from 1957. So Bitcoin was not just invented out of thin air, it builds upon decades of previous work as we see in the references. So this was the foundational document that brought Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to life. But of course, this only is the intellectual foundation. To really understand Bitcoin, we would need to have a look at the software and really understand how it was implemented. And we would also have a deeper look at all of the building blocks that made Bitcoin possible. We need to understand how transactions work, how hashes work, how digital signatures work. We need to understand how proof of work works, how the SHA-256 algorithm works, 
find out how many zeros are required in any particular hash of a block. We need to understand how the network works, how nodes are working together. We need to understand the incentive, both the block reward as well as the transaction fees. We need to understand the disk space requirements. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain grew from 336 gigabytes one year ago to 399 gigabytes today. So it's growing by about 60 gigabytes per year currently. So we need to understand how to reclaim disk space with Merkle trees and cutting off branches of the tree. We need to understand how to verify payments. We also need to understand how transactions actually work with the inputs and the outputs. We need to understand the privacy and why Bitcoin is not necessarily anonymous. And then we also need to understand how the network could be attacked by malicious third parties and what the probabilities are for the attackers to be successful. And then if we would really want to understand it, we would need to go to the references and really understand the work that preceded it. But I think this is enough for today. I hope you liked this deep dive into the Bitcoin white paper. And let me know in the comments whether you have read the Bitcoin white paper before or whether this video was the first time that you actually read the white paper. There's no shame in it and that's actually the purpose why I made this video. So that all of you that never read the white paper would actually have a chance to have a look at it. Have a wonderful day and see you in the next video.